Hi, I'm Yolanda and this is Speak On. Today, we're talking about sex as part of our Love, Sex and Relationship series. Sex work is work, but many people have something to say about it, something negative. We're seeing way more things about sex work now. We're seeing OnlyFans. We're seeing what um, the pandemic has done to the sex work industry. People want to judge these things and people want to judge porn, despite the fact that so many people watch it. So I'm going to talk to someone who's totally awesome. She's Rachel Brownstein. She's a writer. She's a public speaker. She's a thought provoker. She's a vegan YouTube chef. And she used to be a sex worker. And she's going to give us a lot of information, and answer all our questions. Hi, Rachel. How are you today? I'm good. Very good. All things considered, I suppose, mid-apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, <I'm doing> <laughs> How are you doing with the apocalypse? Um, um, ups and downs, to be honest. Uh, but better than I necessarily would have thought. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot to deal with, isn't it? I kind of, I'm still waking up every morning and thinking, oh, and it wasn't a dream. We're still, we're still doing all of this. Yeah, oh, yeah. This is, so this is still happening? Great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's pretty much what it's like, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so yeah. today we're talking about, well, we've got a few things to talk about, but we're starting off with sex work. Like, you know, there is the saying, sex work is work, which is what it is. But people don't think it is. What do you say to those people? <sighs> It's difficult because I think there's a lot of um, centuries, really, isn't there, of, of sex phobia and patriarchal constraints and control. So I understand that people are reluctant to acknowledge the exchange of sexual, sexual services for money or mm -hmm. material goods. Um, but I think we just need to start looking to move past that mindset and accept that we're all in charge of our own bodies and we can make decisions about our own lives and I think once we start doing that and breaking down some of the stigma that surrounds sex work and realize that we do live in a capitalist society and people are not always going to do things that they that other people approve of you know I mean as a as a vegan I don't necessarily approve of people working in abattoirs but that doesn't mean it's not work if that makes yeah. sense yeah, that makes perfect sense. Do you think the um, like sex industry or sex work industry should be legalised and regulated in the UK? So this is, this is a kind of complex topic, but so the having sex for money, prostitution, mm -hmm. we'll call it, is legal in the UK. It's the mm -hmm. things around it that are illegal. Okay. So you can't advertise, you can't solicit, you can't brothel keeping, they call it, you can't pimp it's the things around it that are illegal. For me, I would advocate more for full decriminalization rather than legalization. Mm -hmm. And the reasons for that is once you start having regulated frameworks for people to work within, you still marginalize people. So for example, undocumented migrants, that kind of thing. These people are then still pushed to the outside because they can't provide the documentation that they need to fit the legal requirements. So it's not really protecting people as, as we want them to be protected. Whereas full decrim, you're still protected. You still can call the police if there's a problem. You know, you still have to be, work in a safe environment. It's just, it doesn't criminalize any part of, of the exchange. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I didn't realize that. I, I've, I've just learned so much in that, <laughs> in those few sentences. Um, so tell me how you got into sex work originally and like how you know all this. So I got fed up working minimum wage in restaurants and mm -hmm. it taking a huge physical toll on my body. Um, but I don't have a degree. I've just got GCSEs and a couple of GNVQs and BTECs, that kind of thing. I was like, how can I earn massive amounts of money, but with without you know, being able to be a lawyer or a doctor, that kind of thing. And started thinking about uh, lap dancing, that kind of thing. Decided not to in the end. And then, I don't know, a year later, this must be early 2000s, I think. I then decided to do some escorting, quote unquote, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, having sex for money. Uh, did that and it was fine. And I thought, okay, but wasn't getting a ton of work. So then revisited the lap dancing idea and started doing that. And then I'm quite well endowed up top and the kind of people coming into the clubs would say, how come you're not in page three, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. which uh, 
I think as far as I know, page three has been abolished now. But yeah, I don't think they do it women. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it's topless women in newspapers. So I started making inquiries, found a kind of agency and studio in Leeds, started doing the nude modeling, then got scouted by a large breasts niche magazine, or magazine, did a shoot for them met a photographer for them is friends with the director and he said if you ever want to try doing boy girl stuff uh i want to caveat this but i don't like the term boy girl that's the industry terminology for me i much prefer men women but anyway (laughs) um uh so yeah and so i thought well i've already did i already did the escorting and i didn't hate myself for doing it so i'll try doing films see what happens Mm -hmm. had a blast got paid a good chunk of money and thought well let's try doing this for a while brilliant and so when you first set decided okay I want to I want to try this out I want to get into escorting what how do you how do you start that journey how did you do that so just was it like you look for a paper and then found something then that's what started this whole thing yeah I think casting my mind back I think I looked in it was either I don't know ask Jeeves or Lycos oh my gosh (laughs) yeah (laughs) and kind of googled you know escort agencies leads that kind of thing and my memory doesn't hold details super well so I can't remember the exact details of it but I I mean I can't remember the first time the first booking I ever had so it must have been so average and kind of meaningless in a way that I just haven't retained the details of it Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah I'd sort of I'd do out calls so I would drive around you know get the call from the agency you need to be at this address at this time you know Mm -hmm. get the money up front that was it really yeah did you feel safe though like that first time when you started it because you're essentially you're going to someone's house you don't mm. know who they are or anything are they are they checked is it or is it just like you just luck of the draw and hope they're luck of the draw I mean they do yeah. you know they always claim to do background checks and, and whatnot by I imagine it's very limited on the amount of checking that you can do because you mm. you know you're talking about diving into criminal records and you know that's not public knowledge as far as I'm aware Mm-hmm. Um, so whilst I just had to tell people where I was going to be and say if I haven't contacted you by x time then there's a problem and you need to call the police or you know come and come to the address and help me out yeah I kind of think that you are you're kind of you're you end up being pushed into a situation that's out of your control in a way yeah and did you ever feel like exploited or anything throughout any of that any of the process or any of your roles within the industry no absolutely not I was always in control of what happened. You know, the, you'd, you'd be booked for a boy-girl scene and you'd arrive on set you'd, with your co-star, you'd look at each other's HIV and STI tests and then you'd mm-hmm. have a conversation of uh, don't touch my nipples, don't pull my hair, don't do this. But I do like that. You know, you'd have these conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I always felt in control and able to say if something was going too far or if it was too hard that kind of thing I always felt in a position to be able to do that but Mm -hmm. I mean I went into the industry I must have been mid-20s I think Mm -hmm. and I'm quite a strong-willed woman anyway so I I had that going for me I suppose I can imagine younger people or people who are less able to to vocalize what they want and what they need might find that a bit more challenging yeah and then what did your friends and family think? Or did they know? Yeah, so I told friends. Um, I remember one of my friends was like, when I was thinking about doing it and kind of chatting, I was like, well, I think you're crazy, but if you do it, you'll be amazing at it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, that's friendship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and it just became, it was just a job, you know? So, and it was just like, oh, what are you doing? Are you, you're working tonight, you're doing the escort. And I was like, yeah. And it's, you know, people, I'd had like a, my my ho phone <laughs> so people would be there and I'm like oh, I've, I've got to take a call and they'd just be giggling in the background while I'm discussing rates for anal sex and stuff um and parents yeah not didn't like it at all which is understandable really yeah 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 parents aren't going to be like way to go necessarily on that kind of thing are they um so now you've yeah, well, you you finished your career um in the sex, sex industry like how did you when did you decide to kind of tap out as it were I never made a decision as such. Mm. It just, because I was working mostly in America. I was born in the state, so I'm a US citizen. So I Uh, had none problems of needing a visa or anything. Yeah. And I just, I got to a point where I was suddenly like, I haven't been out to LA in eight months. 
and I don't really want to go back. Mm. So the, there was never a right I'm retiring kind of moment for me. Um, but I just, I was finding it more and more difficult to be excited to go to work. I was getting a bit, oh, this is boring, or I'm not feeling fulfilled. I'm not being creative. I'm not using mm. my brain. I just wasn't, the money wasn't enough anymore. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, the money was always the motivator, but then yeah. other things were a bonus and it just, the bonuses weren't enough anymore. And I just thought I need to move away from this before I get to a point where I hate it and therefore hate myself for continuing yeah. to do it. In terms of like, I don't know, how much, could, how much could you earn on, or did you earn on like an average day? Or what's the most you earn? Uh, so I worked out writing when I wrote my book, I looked at the spreadsheets because, you know, I had to pay taxes, do accounts mm -hmm. and all of that kind of thing. And I, in one year, I'd earned $80,000. Mm -hmm. But that was working, it worked out about a third of the year. Mm -hmm. So I was doing nine months of nothing and three months yeah. of, of work. That kind of, no, that doesn't work out. Four, four months yeah. of work, you know, and eight months of nothing. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the rates are anymore. It's been mm -hmm. a while since I, I left the industry, but I was earning 1100 for a boy-girl scene. Mm -hmm. uh, anal was 1300 boy boy girl anal was 1500 mm -hmm. that kind of thing yeah okay interesting and then did it impact on your like your personal sex life at all or was it just like that is work and this is yeah. my sexy time yeah yeah there was you know there's always a separation and I had a character that I took to work you know she was kept in a suitcase and then put back on when I, you know in the, when I arrived on set yeah and my character was an amplification, I suppose, of my sexuality and kind of an opportunity to go a bit crazy and just do whatever I wanted in a way, as long as it fit the director's brief. Yeah. Um, in terms of relationships, I never had one uh, because mm -hmm. I think mostly because I was traveling for such a large portion of the year, I could spend a month in LA, come home for two months, go back to LA for a month, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So it made having a relationship quite tricky. Mm -hmm. And men, that I encountered typically weren't okay with it you know they, they wanted the sex but they were like oh I couldn't I couldn't be with you in a relationship because what was what would I tell my friends that you do for a living you know they yeah. laugh at me that sort of thing okay just see me just roll my eyes then sorry they just like <laughs> completely disappeared into the back of my head oh so what kind of <laughs> how long were you in the industry for in the end all in probably six seven years you know if I include the escorting the dancing and the um and the, the film work as well mm -hmm. okay and then so you talked there you kind of touched on some of the discrimination that you kind of faced in terms of I mean obviously everybody everybody has their choice who they want to go out with new want to date and be in a relationship with but what kind of discrimination have you faced um like being while being a sex worker but also being a former sex worker as well because I know you've had in your um that I was kind of finding out more about you I know it's affected previous jobs yeah yeah so I was fired twice um once from a video game company mm. and <laughs> apparently a, an executive at Sony had been mm. looking on an escort website and he'd recognize me so man is horny woman gets punished kind of so hold on what was he doing I mean obviously if he's allowed to look on an escort website why aren't you allowed to be there exactly I mean and the, the bit that gets me is at that time I wasn't escorting and yeah but, what these sites will do is it's like a law, you know, they'll put pictures up and then, oh, she's not available, but we've got this person. Yeah, yeah. And the, the company I worked for, the director of the company had worked on Grand Theft Auto, you know, mm. a video game where you can shank prostitutes. Yeah. But, but when they said I was working at a video game company and I'm like, hold on, so everyone, let's list, <laughs> are we pretending that all those people that play video games aren't basically just playing video games and then watching porn the rest of the time? as a sort of yeah. pretending yeah it's just wow it's the hypocrisy in this kind of the cognitive dissonance that comes up time and time and time again it, it, and it's and that's you know partly why I'm speaking out really yeah um, and then the second time this was after the video game company and I on my CV it says actual model mm -hmm. I sat down oh and so I'd applied for the job went on holiday to Thailand Mm -hmm. got a phone call while I was there saying we'd love to give you the job can you start Monday and I was like no I'm in Thailand and they're like oh well oh well <laughs> so I was like oh, well uh, okay so I flew back early from Thailand mm -hmm. for this job at Gaucho mm -hmm. the rest of the state restaurant 
And I sat the manager down and said, look, you need to know, I used to do adult films. Is this a problem? No, nope, not a problem at all. No problem. Went to a training course in Manchester. And on the last day, we all went to the pub afterwards to kind of celebrate finishing this training. And uh, one of the lads went to the toilet, came back and was like, who's Alexis Silver? And I was just like, oh, fuck, here we go. <laughs> so I just stared at my pint, wishing the floor would just swallow me. And they all got the phones out, like Googling it, and looked at me like, so just, you know, barrage of questions starts like it always does. Yeah. By the time I went to work the following week, the manager, <laughs> I walked in, morning, she kind of wouldn't quite meet my eyes. And I'm like, oh, dear. So she said, oh, I need to, I need to speak to you. What's ha- what happened in the pub on Friday has got back to head office and they've said, I have to let you go. I'm really sorry. You didn't do anything. And also that person said, who is Alexis Silver? He knew what he was said. He knew who you were. So he did it to draw attention to you. So of essentially course. he's just an asshole. Yeah. And they, yeah. they, you know, they, it happens a lot. You know, men will approach me in pubs. Yeah. Like, oh my God. You're, you know, and they, they know, they can see I'm with other people. Yeah. And it's like, it, it is, it's either they, they're doing it deliberately to shit stir mm. or they are that clueless that they don't think about the implications. Mm. And I don't think it, anyone can be that stupid <laughs> to yeah. not think about the implications. So I do think it is a malicious. Yeah, it's just trying malicious. to shame you. Yeah. Or they're, or they're putting their dicks, they're, they're making their, you know, their penises the priority in that moment instead of thinking, does this woman want to have a conversation after I've yeah. left? Does yeah. she want to speak to the people she's with about what I've just spoken to her about? Yeah. And also, why would you speak to anyone about anything else? Even, even if it was just about, oh, you work in that cake shop. You just wouldn't even do that in front of other people. It's like, well, you're clearly sitting there enjoying your evening and I don't know you. So that's kind of the end of it. I literally it's can't. <laughs> um, you know, I've spoken to, to male friends about this and they're like, well, I think a lot of it is just appreciation. The same as I'd go up to you know um Jean-Claude Van Damme and say I loved kickboxer and you know that kind of is that star struck kind of thing Mm. and I do sort of understand that but then again it's like but you're when you're talking to a Hollywood star there's no implications whereas Mm. there is with sex work and people know that there is with sex work so it's that and again I suppose that's why I'm speaking out to try and get people to understand the ramifications of these what is a fun exciting moment for you in the pub has massive consequences for me mm-hmm. um, and are you always on alert because of this then oh yeah all the time <laughs> just, you know even I retired 10 years ago but obviously there's loads of stuff all over the internet the companies keep making new films so they'll just cut scenes that I've done and put them on a new dvd mm. uh, so my work's still very current or so people yeah. think um, but yeah, anytime I, every single time I go out to a bar, I get approached by somebody. I love your work. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. Because you know, I don't earn a penny from any of it. Oh, but oh, I, you know, I was about to say, do you get any residues? You don't get any residuals. <gasps> that is yeah. insane. Is Not it because you didn't have an agent? No, I had an agent. That's just how the industry what? is structured. You get your Oh, studio, you your don't get basic. usage. Yeah, you just get your basic studio fee as it would be if, in mainstream terms. Yeah. And that's it. You don't get any royalties, no residual, nothing like that. What? Okay, that's mm. insane. I have a management company, I manage influencers. And if anyone tried to use, someone tried to repost something of one of my clients recently, and I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't get on the phone fast enough to say, run, run me my coin <laughs> or, or, or remove the image. I can't imagine that. Oh man, that's so crappy. Yeah. I mean, I looked when I was writing the book, I looked on Pornhub to see how many views my most viewed video had. And it was 2.5 million. <gasps> I was like, if I even got one cent per yeah. view, you know, it's just yeah. absolutely. And you, but you just accept that's what it is when you mm. first when you start in the industry, because that's how it is. So there's, yeah. if you don't sign, if you don't agree to the terms, then you don't work. That is such a shame. I hope there's some kind of reformation in it going forward, because it's so obviously there are a lot lots of industries are subject to exploitation but mm. that I'm like god if I was going to do that I'd be like I want usage <laughs> I, want, yeah, I, mean, I yeah. think that's why platforms uh, and I know it's problematic but only fans and mm. you know these sort of content creator driven platforms yeah. I think are very much the way forward where absolutely have much more control over their content and over the prices that they set and how they they profit and benefit from that material that they're creating 
Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I think yeah I think I've got some a client that's on OnlyFans and I know other people that are and I'm just like you know what get get your get your money make your money it's it's safe for you you can control it and yeah yeah, it's coming through to you and it's not going through to anyone else and that's all you can ask for really I think that's the best way to kind of have true ownership over your work absolutely I know you know it is is problematic and there's you know somebody is profiting off that and you know then you get the Bella Thorne saga oh don't even get me started on that yeah (laughs) and now it's the sex workers and people who rely on that money they're the Mm. ones that are suffering while she's swallowing swimming around in a fucking mansion (laughs) I know that whole thing was ridiculous and yeah and then everyone else has to pay the price I just don't I think I don't even know. How, I'm not sure how they could have regulated their way out of that one before she got there. Or I'm not sure what kind of barrier they could have put in place. But it's just the whole thing is like, Bella, just don't lie. Just don't. Let's just not do things for attention, shall we? Um, yeah. People are trying to earn money to pay their bills. Um, yeah. Ugh. But um, <laughs> what did the adult film industry teach you about like sex and life and anything? Hmm, That's a good question. So again, it's it's difficult to attribute anything specifically to porn, or if that's mm-hmm. just me, if it's me, because I am a slightly, I think, neurodivergent anyway, mm-hmm. very, you know, logical and outspoken and forthright and direct. But I think it's it helped me be more vocal in getting my needs met sexually, mm-hmm. you know, and if some if a guy is doing something that. I'm just like I don't I don't like that <laughs> will you stop it please do something else like, you know and being able to to make demands sexually and respectfully obviously and with consent um but it is hard to to say that is porn that's done that or if that would have happened anyway mm-hmm. but I think it's helped me be more aware of the discrimination the stigma the this sort of hysterical anti-sex pearl clutching society that we live in Mm -hmm. um you know you you become it's quite easy to become radicalized and sort of anti-capitalist and this kind of thing when you are a sex worker because you see how how badly you're treated Mm -hmm. and then you can start identifying well that's the cause of that and what can i do about that yeah Um, but i think it's also it's surprisingly transferable skills as well (laughs) (laughs) love it (laughs) yeah (laughs) I started doing mainstream acting about six, five, six years ago. Mm-hmm. And from the start, everyone's like, you're very comfortable in front of the camera to say, you're like, you know, you've just yeah. started. I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> this time I'm fully clothed. Right? Yes. Well, that's it. That's yeah. it. It's, it teaches you how to, because you're an entrepreneur, you're a businesswoman, you know, mm-hmm. you're, I have to book international work and travel, do my taxes, do two mm-hmm. lots of taxes. because I had to do US and UK. Mm -hmm. it does teach you a wide range of skills and uh, yeah (laughs) they are (laughs) wonderfully transferable love that Um, and are you still acting now do you have you had any chances to yeah so I mean obviously COVID has put paid to uh, yeah (laughs) many things Uh, we've had to kind of hold on a production I'm working on uh, The Shadow Over Whitby it's called yeah and it's uh, inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft yeah oh yeah um, yeah so we've been shooting in in Whitby you know every mm-hmm. every month or so uh, it's a little ind- independent thing so it's a funding you know funding mm-hmm. dictates when we can shoot yeah. yeah everything's on hold at the moment sadly and then it, it's I mean and I haven't been looking for work as much as I should have been because I'm just like I can't travel anywhere because mm-hmm. I'm sh- you know I'm kind of shielding myself so I don't really want to be getting on trains to London <laughs> yeah work, of course kind of thing. yeah oh wow so that's so cool though that that you've been able to transition from the like adult film industry into kind of tv and film mainstream tv and film was that um is, is that is is your like i don't know like porn past ever an issue with that or do they just not care they're like well you know what to do in front of a camera happy days well it's difficult to know um yeah. so because there are <laughs> there are men that keep attaching my two names together okay yeah i'm sort of making youtube playlists and putting both names and they only know my real name because I was doxxed. So somebody no. committed a criminal offence against me. And then I get these dickheads cartwheeling into my DMs like, ah, I love your work. And I'm like, you know my name because Alexa Silva doesn't appear anywhere on any of my social media. I'm like, mm. And you're expecting me to be 
you know, positive about having an interaction with you? Why mm. would you think that? Um, so, and if you Google my name, it doesn't take many scrolls to start seeing the porn. So I don't yeah. know if casting directors have done any research and thought, well, no, I don't want her on, mm. on a production. Difficult to know. Yeah. And then I did a film, uh, I'd be about two years ago now, I suppose. <laughs> Time and space has folded. <laughs> <in my laughs> um, and it was reviewed by somebody who had recognised me. And he was like, some of you may know her from her past in adult films. And the director messaged me and said, this guy has written in this in the review and screenshotted it. And he said, you know, she said, I've, I've asked him not to do it. And I've, <laughs> I'm really fucking annoyed with him about it. I, I just don't know if, I don't think he's going to take it out and I was like well it is what it is what yeah. is nothing that can be done but you know there are and it is always men I'm not saying this because I hate men or anything. that's not why no. I'm saying men but it is always men that do this shit yeah it's because they don't there's so many that don't know how to act right yeah mm. it's just I think part of it is a woman should know her place and you know seeing somebody in control of their of their lives and their finances pisses them off and they mm. just don't react favorably to it. You know, so I'm mm. going to keep that whore in the box that I put her in. That's where mm. she should be. Yeah. Oh gosh, don't even get me started. Me and my friend were having a discussion about this when someone's saying not all men last night, and we were just like, we were just like, we can't with that statement. We cannot with that statement. So we will revisit yeah, of that. It's not all men, but it's the vast yeah. majority of them. Exactly. And it's, <laughs> you know, and it's just. And so many of them will see something shitty happening on Twitter and then mm. they'll DM me like, oh, I can't believe that knobhead. I'm like, why are yeah. you well, doing you say, yeah. why say you it? Say it out loud. I mean, I yeah. have some fucking conviction, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I de- we're going to have a, a pod about that and I'm definitely going to have to get you on for it. Um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so now you... Um, you like you you've started publicly you're a public speaker you're a thought provoker which I love I love that title so much how did you get into kind of public speaking thought provoking and kind of being an advocate for sex workers rights and what do you do so I've been thinking for a while like I've got all this mad knowledge in my head (laughs) to me it's just very average and mundane it's my job whatever but whenever I speak to people about it uh, people are fascinated about the kind of nitty gritty of it all and the details because all they see is the media portrayals and the Louis Theroux documentaries and that mm-hmm. kind of thing so I thought well I've got all this stuff in my head and you know perhaps I should do something with it and you know you keep I keep reading these articles about the public health crisis and children watching porn I'm like well is that really as what's going on is it, is it as bad as they're making out and I was contacted by a medical student mm-hmm. who was, they had to create a, a sex education package for a high school and cover mm-hmm. porn literacy. Yeah. And I said, just acknowledge the fact that none of us know anything about the industry other than as viewers and consumers. So it would be kind of wrong for us to teach mm-hmm. something we don't know anything about, really. Would you be up for coming in and speaking to us? Mm-hmm. I thought, well, that's odd timing <laughs> considering yeah. I'd just been thinking what can I do about this you know this stuff in my head uh, so I said yeah I'll, I'll do it and a friend of mine who used to to do films as well we went together sat in this group with I don't know 20 20 to 30 medical students chatted to them about it and answered all their questions and afterwards they, a few of them came up and were like you've made me realize I had judgments about what you were going to be like and you, you've just smashed that out of the water, you know, and it's made me realise I need to do a lot of work on myself mm-hmm. and about how um, judgmental I am. And you've made me realise that you're not abused, you're not exploited. And I do, you know, I really appreciate you doing that. And so we came, my friend and I came away from it feeling very positive from what we'd done, you know, just because... It, my intention is never to say porn is good or porn is bad. It's just to say porn is this. This is my experience of it. And my experience isn't necessarily representative of everybody's experience, but it, it's one voice among many. Yeah. And then the medical student said, would you like to do another one, maybe a slightly bigger? And we'll open it up to the, the whole student body. Oh, yeah, why not? Okay. So it's like, oh. <laughs> and so she kind of took off with the planning stuff and came back and said, the only auditorium that we can get on that day 
is the biggest one on campus, but we'll just get everyone to sit in the first couple of rows. That's fine, no problem. Mm -hmm. On the day, my friend was coming along who is a high school teacher and he'd kind of prompted this discussion. You know, you need to talk to kids about your experiences because it's pretty bad, the kind of shit they're getting up to with each other. And he phoned from outside and was like, they're queuing out to the main road. <laughs> it was like there's hundreds wow. of people here. And I was like, bar? <laughs> what do you mean? And we filled, filled the biggest auditorium at Leeds University, which is, I think it was like 400 students. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done? But we, you know, similar kind of format, talked. We gave enough information to then have a big Q&A session so that people mm -hmm. could ask their own questions. And because I think it's all good and well me talking about things, but it's nicer when people can ask the questions that they want to, to have the answer to. We did all of it and then we got to the end and they all stood up and started clapping. And I just burst into tears. Oh. <laughs> I just felt this amazing sense of, it was like I suddenly hit my groove. I'd found mm -hmm. what I needed in my life in a way. Yeah. Like I was clearly engaging these young minds and expanding their awareness of of the world around them and they saw me cry and started clapping louder it was just one of those moments that will stay with me till I die I think yeah and then that really made me realize okay people are very interested in what I've got to say mm -hmm. and the way I say it clearly engages them so what can I do with this so I carried you know done a few more lectures did one at Sheffield University um and then I was like, right, well, maybe I should write a book because <laughs> yeah. people have said for like over a decade, you need to write a book. And I haven't got a book. There's nothing to write about. It's just a job. Mm. But it made me realize being able to just write about how to cleanse your, your colon for an anal scene <laughs> yeah. in explicit detail. People are interested in this kind of thing. Yeah. And it shows, again, it's not about I wasn't forced into the industry. I wasn't trafficked. I wasn't abused. I wasn't exploited. It's mm -hmm. just a very, and it's, it is a memoir, but then it's packed full of information as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's links to stuff about syphilis and, you know, discussing legalization versus decrim. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's all sorts of other random bits of information because my head is very random and chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> all kind of it sounds up. like you've got like, possibly to have like a few volumes <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's one of those things like, I, so I each, I've done it, each chapter is a question. So it's how did you get into the industry or what do women do when they're on the periods? And then mm -hmm. the body of the, the chapter is me answering all these questions. Yeah. And it wasn't until I started writing that I realized how much was in there, you know, and I'd suddenly get these random memories popping up. Like, oh my God, I remember when I rode somebody around the Staples Center in LA after watching a hockey game, not like sexually rode. <laughs> okay. Oh but you know just these really fun things that have just become very average okay and sorry what <laughs> i've been to the stables there now what so we went to oh this is it's such a mad story when i think about it so we did we had to do 13 i think it was 13 girl cum swap so <laughs> yeah one guy got a blow job and then we each spat the cum into the progressive okay the other one. yeah and then afterwards the guy yeah, you know, yeah. and afterward, the guy took us all in a limo to the Staples Center, and it was the, uh, I think it was Rangers versus Kings hockey match, yeah. and me and one of my friends went outside for a cigarette, and we'd all been drinking all afternoon, got chatting to these guys, you know, we were wearing these t-shirts with the, the company name and logo on it, and we got chatting, and oh my god, your porn style looks really cool, that's fun, and then we were walking back, and for some reason decided to have a piggyback race <laughs> so, yeah. just like, so me and my friend on these two guys yeah and I'm just cantering down the corridor and I'm screaming at the top of my voice like ride sea biscuit ride like the wind just, <laughs> but that was that was what that was what life was like just mad yeah. slightly random oh but God. full of laughter <laughs> Did you um? Did you actually when you were um like when you were working out there as a porn star? Did you meet any famous people or anything? Um, I don't know if you're to say, but well, yeah, I, yeah, a couple, but nothing. Mm. Uh, yeah, nothing remarkable. And it's okay. yeah, I never like to sort of gossip. Yeah, that that's sense. fair enough. That makes sense. I love that. Where's uh, where are you at the moment with your book? 
So yeah, doing some final final tweaks yeah. and polishing bits, but it's yeah, it's more or less complete. Oh my gosh! And then when can we expect that to be out? When can when can I buy it? Is I'm what I'm sure. asking. Sure, it's yeah. um, it's one of those. It's a long a long process and sort of getting the you know finding an agent or yeah, you know, I've discovered um, so a friend of mine, Kate Lister, who's mm-hmm. at Oars of Your on Twitter. Yeah, has wrote a, a Curious History of Sex, which is an amazing book. Everyone should read it. Uh, and she used a publisher called Unbound, yeah, which is like a crowdfunding platform. So I've been thinking that might be a fantastic way of, of getting yeah. getting it out there as well. Absolutely, yeah, do that and do a bunch of pre-orders or something. I am, I would absolutely, absolutely read that book from front to back. I'm really excited. I want to hear more as well. I was going to ask you more questions from the book, but I'm like, no, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. You have to just, you're going to have to buy it. You're going to have to, they're going to have to follow you. They're going to have to follow the journey and they're going to have to buy it and read it. Absolutely. That's it. So I need to kind of, yeah, build my audience really and, and get yeah. enough people clamoring for, for what I've got to say. Love that. So alongside, oh my goodness, what this, you have so many stories that I can't wait to read. So alongside, uh, you know, teaching medical students and teaching kind of like porn literacy, you also advocate for sex workers rights as well. So what do you do in that arena? I mean, I've been, I wouldn't say hiding, but I tried to walk away from, from sex work and distance myself from it after, mm. you know, after the impact it had with the jobs and that kind of thing. It was only the last couple of years, really, that I've been a bit more vocal. Mm. And w- what I try and do really is, is raise voices on, particularly on Twitter. So the English Collective of Prostitutes, Swarm, any accounts like that that talk about anything going through in the law or, you know, the decrim versus uh, legalization conversations and just amplify those voices as much as I can, you know, donate some money as much as I can wherever possible. Mm-hmm. So it's about, for me, it's uplifting the voices of other people, you know, because yeah. I'm retired. I don't have any real dice in the game anymore. Mm-hmm. But if I, by me speaking, if I can get people's attention and get them thinking, and maybe I don't know the full story here, but this woman's got me curious and that's how I want to kind of, you know, introduce people into thinking you don't know the full story. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much more to learn. And we all have unconscious bias anyway, so we carry any, like just regardless. But with something that has for so long been put in this dark place, even though eh, like so many people in the world benefit from it, use it, access it. It's, it's really weird. And I think at the moment, it I feel like there's so much, um, there's increasing conversation about it, particularly during the pandemic because of what OnlyFans is brought to light and, you know, changes on, at Pornhub and everything else. Yeah. I feel like when I'm having conversations, people seem more accepting of, of things. What was, like, what's your experience of that? Are yeah, you, do think, you feel like there's an acceptance happening or? I think people are more aware that it's not just, and I think a lot of people have this, you know, when you talk about sex workers or prostitutes, they, they only see it as people who work on, you know, do street-based work. Mm-hmm. And like, that's the tip of the iceberg. What you're not seeing is, you know, the, the older people, not older, but, you know, sort of post forties, the aged women who are working mm-hmm. at home, perhaps have children to look after and single-handedly, mm-hmm. you know, you're not really seeing the full spectrum of sex work. It means so many different things. Um, and I think there is a stereotype, isn't there? Especially with film, adult film stars, that we're all stupid, <laughs> or that you know, just thick as fuck. Uh, so by speaking out and being able to to clearly set out and clearly speak in a way that's engaging, I think that kind of puts people back a bit. Like, oh, that this woman doesn't doesn't match my stereotype of what I thought. So maybe it's harder to dismiss her. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much. Uh, there's so much more to learn I think as people are we we've done a few different podcasts we talked to um like someone on OnlyFans and we've been talking to different sex workers and when we're getting feedback we are getting people I think starting to realize oh yeah this this person's quite cool we have a lot to learn this is really interesting they're just out here functioning like they're just functioning in a I suppose in a I, I don't want to say normal but you know in a way that we, ex- you know, in a way that we feel we're functioning. I think that's what they're trying to say to me. They feel they kind of, they feel more alignment than they realise. They thought it would be completely different. Now more, there are dark sides to it. Like there are dark sides to lots of industries. We know there's dark sides to the music industry, to the, to like the mainstream film industry. 
and yeah. everything that's happened me too and all that stuff I think that people are starting to realize there are different levels to it and Absolutely. understand it a bit more yeah I think yeah I think people or certain people are very quick to to speak about how exploitative sex work is mm. but they're typically doing so while wearing clothes that have been blatantly made in sweatshops in the you know countries in the developing world mm-hmm. you know and thousands of women are dying because these factories are so unsafe and yet where's the where are you fighting for their rights where are you mm-hmm. fighting for their change you know it just seems when genitals are involved that it it, people have just become a bit more weird about it and it's like if you're weird about your own genitals that's fine but don't be weird about anyone else's they've got nothing exactly. to do with you yeah exactly. <laughs> just everybody do what they want with their genitals yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. exactly just don't obsess about it um so one of the things that you are particularly passionate about is pornography and sex education as well so can you explain a bit more about that because obviously i know we talked about porn literacy but do you think that um there's been some chat recently actually about let me just get, get this right young people kind of learning about sex education from porn more than they're learning about it from school but then what you're learning from porn isn't necessarily conducive to everyday life like what are your thoughts on it yeah so it's I guess for me it's not I don't know if it's a passion it's more of a necessity but yeah. I've seen so I spoke to a group of young well they were boys you know it's kind of 11 to 13 kind of age group and mm-hmm. the stuff they were coming out with I was like Jesus wet lads like <laughs> what you know like oh I was really disappointed when I was having sex with this bird and she didn't look anything like the you know the women in porn <laughs> like so you think a 13 year old girl in Bradford is going to look the same as a woman in Los Angeles who is in the film industry yeah 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 yeah, we should and I'm like and do you think you look like men in pornography (laughs) it's it's complete you know women should look like this but it's fine you know if I look Mm. like a sack of sports yeah no it's this is that real dissonance um Mm. and I think and it keeps coming up again and again Mm. Uh, so the students for example after the lectures he said yeah I didn't get any sex education in school at all Mm. particularly around porn so I just I've had to teach myself by using porn. And I'm like, but porn isn't really sex in, mm. in a way. I know it is, but, mm. you know, if... It's choreographed, if, isn't it? And yeah, it's kind of know, coordinated. Absolutely. You know, and what you see, that 20-minute clip on, or 10-minute clip on Pornhub probably took about six hours to film, mm. you know, and very few men that I've had sex with, civilians, mm. can last <laughs> like that. And they shouldn't wonder yeah. they shouldn't worry about that because you know it's in the same way that if a kid wanted to learn how to drive would you put them in front of fast and the furious or top gear no yeah. because it's not the same thing you know it's a very heightened amplified and kind of sensationalized version of sexuality mm-hmm. so i think i mean i remember sex education at school and it was just cringe inducing and embarrassing and the teacher was clearly horrified at having to do this (laughs) yes and for me I think there needs to be uh so I'm not saying I have all of the solutions and my ideas are the only way you know I'm just coming up with ideas Hmm. I wonder is it not better to have someone who takes on a role of perhaps guidance counsellor but then Mm -hmm. takes the sex education classes so that kids can think okay I'm speaking to this person about intimate things and about sex and it's not I'm not then gonna have to sit in front of them and learn about history yes or science you know yeah. so it becomes much more taught within a more safer space and there's I think that would help develop a bit more of a respect in the, that sort of teacher pupil you know thing that you keep butting up against when oh you know how can you talk to me about the square root of 64 when you've been talking about how to put a condom on my dick kind of yeah thing. and I think because we still we're still living in a society that's really weird about sex so I watched uh, I was watching tv recently and the new Duracell tv commercial came on yeah it was two people sit like a parent and a a child in front of watching a nature documentary and the two animals start having sex and then the, the you know the parent and child start freaking out trying to find the remote control like really are we still perpetuating this thing that sex is embarrassing yeah you know and I'm not I just, I just think, think like you know I understand humor 
is an effective way of getting a message across but mm. you know you're you're just deepening stigma and shame about sex and I don't think that's particularly healthy for anybody yeah whereas I think if we can start having slightly more respectful and even-headed conversations about sex and porn as well because porn is in the vernacular every day you know property porn poverty porn torture porn makeup porn interior porn you know it's everything's porn so how can you be you know expecting kids not to be curious about this word well what is porn like I got a a menu for a takeaway and they sell cocktails and it had porn star martini so how is the kid not going to pick that up and be like mom what's a porn star you know and then the parent doesn't have you know doesn't feel comfortable explaining that because they haven't been given the tools to do that Mm. so I just I think we need to just be a bit more level-headed and stop trying to protect the children you know and you don't have to go into explicit detail with a five-year-old but you can just you know kind of cover you know the overarching uh, concept in a way Mm. that's go and ask your father you know or I'll tell you when you're older because I think that just fuels curiosity well if mum says it's naughty then I definitely need to find out what this is about I'm going to go and google it and you don't want kids googling porn no no. and of course like you're saying you were speaking to like quite young young boys there because you know we are if we delay telling people about things or especially now in the age the age of information kids younger and younger and younger and younger are accessing porn so you know the age when I started using the internet lol um it was such a long time ago so it wasn't actually that accessible. That point, that was, I remember my male friends who, uh, they love porn. And I was like, that's fair enough, you do you. But they had videos and DVDs and they had like whole entire collections of it because at that point, it wasn't actually that easy to get to watch it online. Whereas now any kid could pick up a phone and just watch it online. So you have to really start that conversation, particularly about porn quite Absolutely. early. Well, the content blockers, the parental settings you know there are so many ways around these things Mm. you know the kids kids are canny when it comes to tech you know they they know how to substitute letters and you know and and there are providers that are are unscrupulous I can't say this bloody word unscrupulous (laughs) (laughs) you know and so they make it easier for the kids to to circumvent the things and you know and then they're going to start using VPNs they're going to start going on the deep web we really don't want kids on the deep web Mm. you know it's just not a place where we need just I don't know I don't know what the answer is fully in it and I don't have kids so I all I can talk about I have to talk about this from a distance really Mm -hmm. but if I did I suppose I'd think about my kid is going to watch porn and there's nothing I can do about that so how can I do that with harm reduction as a goal yes you know and think about it from that angle Mm -hmm. because I think it is as soon as you start making something taboo or something that you do when you're older kids want to be adults why I don't know because being an adult sucks (laughs) like (laughs) taxes (laughs) just loads of boring shit and pains and making involuntary noises when you stand up and sit down oh yeah Um, (laughs) you know I think I think by educating people educating kids I think we'll start seeing a shift generationally you know, and we'll become more tolerant of each other and the differences of opinion. And it will become less easy to exploit people because we're going to have a better vocabulary for getting our own own needs met. That makes yeah, sense. that makes perfect sense. And I think as well, you know, you, when you were saying, talking about those, the, how young kids and their perception of what sex will be, it'd be the pressure that it puts on, the pressure that it puts on whoever their sexual partner is going to be and the pressure that it puts on themselves and what that will do to their own psyche what that's going to do to the psyche of the person if they scrutinize them out loud there's so many different implications and I was speaking to one of my friends gosh I remember she she made a point where she said you can tell guys that just watch a lot of porn when they're having sex with you compared to guys that have different experience or maybe just watch slightly less because they just they just go on a mad one in bed just um, they just do all sorts of things. they're picking up picking you up every two minutes and turning you around and she was I was there was a bunch of us and we were laughing so much because she was also acting it out but I was like you've got a good point it's when people when their sex education is aligned with something that isn't necessarily realistic then they're just gonna go around acting mad and then everybody's like that person is terrible in bed <laughs> just yeah and I, I I don't know why guys have got this 
you know, they're so obsessed with, well, my dick isn't as big as it is in porn, mm. or I can't, I can't last for as long. It's like, I don't want sex like that. Like, it, it, it's just, it's uncomfortable after a yeah. while, you know? You know, if I've shot, you know, back-to-back scenes and, you know, my <laughs> vagina resembled a bagel, it's so <laughs> swollen and battered, you know, it's, yeah. it's not something to be mimicked and emulated in the bedroom. Yeah. You know, sex should be about creating a moment together, you know, and having some real heat and fire. And you can't create that while you're flipping someone around and pile driving them. And it's ridiculous shit that just doesn't need to be done in real life. Absolutely. I love that. Uh, oh, you know, that's just what I forgot to ask you. How many, like, um, in an, like, I don't know, I'm trying to think, not an average day, but no, actually in an average day for work, how many people would you um, have sex with when you were filming? And how long would that last? So it's typically, it was usually, I think the most, I, I did a couple of orgy scenes, mm. but I only interacted with, I think, two other people. Mm. Um, but it's just staged to look very wild. But, you know, I was very clear, I'm having sex with two people because that's what you're paying me for. Mm. And I won't touch anybody else. I did a couple of, I think, I think girl, girl, boy, boy scenes. So me plus three other people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of the most, really. Um, but in terms of shooting, like, God, I mean, the longest day I ever spent on set was 13 hours. Oh, my God. That was from arriving. Yeah, and yeah. makeup around. and everything. Yeah, yeah. Doing your tests, doing your paperwork. Mm-hmm. Guy can't get, you know, guy on the scene before. He can't get wood. Then the guy after him, he can't come. So you're just sitting around on my Nintendo DS or reading something. <laughs> this is so boring. And then you've got to, you know, be on camera and be super sexy. Mm. Like, I'm just hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, on average, you're looking. And again, this changes now that everything's more on filmed for online and the, and the kind of gonzo porn, as it's called. So not the, uh, not with, without scripts yeah yeah feature kind of stuff but on average yeah sort of anywhere from four to eight hours and then you're talking at least a good two three hours solid of sex my goodness that is that sounds exhausting yeah it's physically punishing yeah there's a reason why most people in in porn have ripped bodies Mm. because you need it to physically you know you so if you want uh, so, for example, you do oral on both and then you want three or four different sex positions. You need to hold each position for 15, 20 minutes so you can get all the different angles. You've got to be able to keep the energy up and oh my goodness. proper go for it for an extended amount of time. So you have to be physically fit. Yeah. Wow. Goodness me. That's just, I'm learning so much. Um, <laughs> so back to um, <laughs> your memoir. So mm. when you st- when did you start writing your memoir exactly? How long t- has that it was, taken you to do that? I think summer of, again, space and time has folded. Yeah. <laughs> uh, summer of 2019. Yes, we're 21, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> summer of 2019. Mm. Um, but it felt amazing like I'd started something and finished it for once yeah (laughs) I do that a lot like I'll do this thing now and and then nothing happens um yeah but it was a incredible process in a way to to get these things out and explore things that I thought I'd completely forgotten about and be able to to be funny but then be hard-hitting be vicious (laughs) be all these different things like I am yeah well, I mean, alongside that, you also have your, uh, you have Auntie Rachel's Chaotic Kitchen. So yes. when did that start? Was that while you were writing your memoir? Was it after, like, what, what's the timeline on that? So the Chaotic Kitchen is, uh, is very much my COVID baby. Yeah. My, uh, so I started the beginning of lockdown. Mm-hmm. I could feel my, I have depression, anxiety, and I could feel myself like circling the drain of a major depressive episode. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, what am I going to do? So I started cooking for like eight hours a day and I'd post on social media and people were like, why don't you have a YouTube channel? Like show people how to cook all these amazing vegan foods. Cause that is something I look, I would like to try. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, why not? It gives me something to do and it's creative because I'm, I am a creative person, but acting relies on other people and it takes time. Writing relies on other people, takes time, you know, all of the speaking Whereas food, I can cook and within an hour, I've got something, I've got like a creative 
um, final product. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, I just started spending 14 hours a day in the kitchen, filming, cooking, planning, teaching myself how to edit. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's become this massive project, but I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of myself. And I, I can see, get all the analytics on YouTube. And even though I know this is wrong, because I know women watch it, but according to YouTube, 100% of my viewers are male. Okay. <laughs> this piece is so yeah. rare for a cooking channel. And I, can, and I know people, you know, they because they find these playlists that dickhead mm -hmm. men have created. Yeah. And come and say, oh, I, I, I loved your old work, but I'm really proud of what you're doing now. And I love watching you in the kitchen having fun. It's just great. Yeah. You know, seeing you doing something so different is wonderful. I love that. <laughs> I love such a I love, I love that you started this thing in COVID. And now it's just become an actual. It's become an actual thing. So now you've you've written your um, first book. Are you going to write a cookbook? Do you think? Is that where you think that's going to go? Uh, yeah, I'd love to do that. It would be yeah. a really fun project, I think, because it's. I became vegan three years ago, and I've kind of, I've had to. I I love meat, right, and I love animal products. I just hate what's involved. Yeah, but. I started then being able to analyze quite specifically, what do I miss about meat? What is it about meeting, eating meat that I loved so much? And then thinking, well, how can I replicate a similar kind of experience? Like I want the chew in the back teeth and that, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it widened my, uh, cause I've always been a cook, you know, I've loved cooking from a small age, young age, small person. <laughs> uh, but finally being able to have more creativity and more inventiveness. And I, and I lie in bed at two in the morning, like, but can you make a sweet potato out of, or can you make fudge out of a sweet potato? Is that possible? <laughs> Just stop fixating on it for hours. I'm like, oh my God, I have to fucking get up and do it now, don't I? <laughs> Otherwise I'll never sleep. So it's, it, yeah, it's an, it's an opportunity to be playful and experimental and just kind of explore different possibilities. Yeah. I love that you the every all the different things you do. It's like, yes, I'm advocating for sex workers' rights. Yes, I am at the forefront of porn literacy. Also, I really want to talk about sex education and pornography and the relationship between that and make those changes. And also, here's a sweet potato pie. <laughs> yeah, it's like multiple strings to my bow. It's, it's <laughs> awesome. It's awesome. Well, I mean, what would you what would you like to like to wrap up? What would you like to say to anyone that doesn't think that sex work is work and that discriminates against sex workers? I respect that viewpoint and I understand possibly where it's been formed from. But I would gently suggest to perhaps just start reading the experiences of people like myself and even more importantly, people who are currently working in the industry, be that in the film or doing full service sex work and start looking yourself at why you have these preconceptions, why you think they're being exploited and read their experiences rather than relying on documentaries or, you know, another hooker died on CSI Miami because she was in a bad place and she was hooked on drugs you know start looking at why if you want to get rid of sex work you need to get rid of work but mm. I don't think people are ready for that conversation yet we, you know <laughs> we live in a consumer driven society that demands that we work hard like good little piggies and we fund the machine and we can't undo that until we start having conversations about what comes after money brilliant thank you so much Rachel for joining me and this has been great and I absolutely can't wait to get you on again because we have so many more conversations to have and I can't wait for you to come back on when you've released your memoir, when you've released your cookbook and also when you release your government funded program to teach, pornography, teach about pornography in schools and the relationship between that and sex education. I mean, because that's where we're going with this really. <laughs> And where can people find you online? Where do you want, where do you want to be found online? <laughs> Nowhere, I'm a bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Come and say hi at, so on Instagram, you uh, know, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, mm -hmm. Auntie Rachel, and it's A-U-N-T-I-E, and then R-8-C-H-E-L. Mm -hmm. Those are my main socials. And on YouTube, it's Auntie Rachel's Chaotic Kitchen. Brilliant. 
thank you so much for your time today and thank I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you for listening to speak on make sure you like subscribe and share with your friends family co-workers strangers in the street to find out more about us including our upcoming events head over to instagram instagram.com forward slash speak underscore bye